In the United States of America, there are just shy of 40 million people who hold hunting licenses. Generally speaking, many of these individuals hold great knowledge of the wilderness and are very skilled out in these areas. Let's explore some of these individuals who have gone missing without a trace. 17-year-old Corey Fair disappeared on the 23rd of November 1991 within the eastern edge of the Mount Hood National Forest of Oregon. At the time, Corey was out elk hunting with two of his friends and at some point they had separated in order to cover more ground. They agreed to meet back up again in the afternoon, but Corey would never show up. It seems that one of the reasons the three split up was because this particular spot would usually hold elk in their abundance at this time of the year. However, for whatever reason, at no point did they spot even a single elk, which is a little odd. The two remaining friends initially waited at the agreed meeting place for a little while, thinking that Corey had either strayed a little too far and was taking longer to come back, or was just wrapping things up with hunting. An hour went by, and then another one, and the pair began to panic before setting out in Corey's general direction to look for him. For hours, they called out and shouted for Corey, but they would never receive a reply or see anything to indicate a direction that he might have took. At 6.30pm, the pair were able to contact the authorities, who arrived quickly, and a professional search was organised. It seems that the authorities themselves weren't particularly worried initially, because Corey was out hunting and obviously was equipped with means of defending himself. He also had a space blanket, a compass, bandages, matches, and water purification tablets. So, not only did Corey have the means to defend himself, he also had means of keeping warm and making water relatively safe, provided he could find a source. On Monday, tracking dogs, a mounted posse, and a helicopter equipped with heat-seeking infrared equipment joined the search for Corey, who was reported missing in the Badger Creek Wilderness. Searchers believed they found a campfire face set on Saturday night, but there were no other signs of him. We were in the right spot, but the elk weren't there, and pretty soon Corey wasn't there, said one of the friends. He said he searched for Corey until dark when he notified the sheriff's office. His mother had this to say. He's been in the woods a few times, but he's basically a city boy. He has good common sense, but it bothers me that he is not on one of these roads. The assumption was that Corey must have wandered off and got lost because there was no evidence of anything else. It appeared as that at some point he set up that campfire which gave the searchers a central point to focus on, but nothing was found after that. There was no evidence anywhere to suggest animal predation, and weirdly, no one ever heard any shots going off. Corey had the ability to fire into the air to make his presence known, but it seems that he never did this for some reason or at the very least, it was never heard. That fact is quite difficult to understand actually, because you'd imagine, especially just after going missing, when the friends began to look for him, you'd think that he shouldn't have been too far away, so they should have heard it. Perhaps he'd panicked or something and never thought to do it, but it's not completely clear. Or perhaps he was just well out of range at this point. A few more days into the search, Elk returned to the area in which search teams and helicopters were scouring with infrared thermal cameras, and while they were picking up many elk, they never picked up Corey. After being unable to find anything at all, authorities were trying to provide an explanation as to why this was the case. Sheriff Art LeBrouse said that there is a 50% chance that Corey wasn't even there anymore and had hiked out of the search zone. And, he said, there was less than a 20 to 30% chance that they'd be able to find him within the grid search area. I'm not sure how the math there works, but putting the abacus away, it seems that the sheriff was just attempting to justify why Corey wasn't being found. The sheriff says halting the search for Corey missing for 8 days was a tough call, but the boy's father says he's not giving up hope. It was the hardest decision I ever had to make. It's the right one, it's just not an easy one, said Sheriff LeBrouse. Throughout the duration of the search, there were over 100 people searching around the clock to find Corey, 
which of course they never did. Now, I did come across an unusual aspect and quote surrounding this disappearance. Train teams from 12 counties intensified their search Friday night after tracks were spotted and somebody responded to a searcher's shout. Nothing was found, despite a grid search of the area pinpointed by searchers and a helicopter carrying infrared equipment. So just to put that straight, as the searchers were scouring the area, they found tracks that they believed were left behind by Corey, and then shortly afterwards in the vicinity, or rather close proximity to the tracks, they called for Corey, and someone responded. They went to look in the direction of the response while continuing to call out his name, but never heard him, or whoever responded again. The infrared cameras never picked up who may have made the response either. This must have caused some confusion, but obviously it caused people to believe that he must be around, and it led to Corey's father stating that he knows that Corey's still out there, and that he won't leave without him. The father, family, friends, and other volunteers then conducted their own search after the official one met its conclusion. Weirdly, there was no more reporting on this incident in the forest in which someone responded to the searches. You might expect that there might be more to be said about that, though I suppose in fairness, they did scour that area shortly thereafter and found nothing. It's difficult to even comment about that really. I'm not sure what to make of it. After the report on bringing the search to an end, that was basically the end of the paper trail, at least until 10 months later where I came across this headline. Bone fragments may be young hunter. Bone fragments found east of Mount Hood are probably those of Corey Fair, Sheriff Art LeBrow said. About 30 searchers fanned out into the woods after the remains and found Fair's rifle, backpack, hunting license and articles of clothing were found. Fair's belongings were found by deer hunters about 2 to 3 miles from the area covered by the ground search. But it had been searched by helicopters, LeBrow said. The items were 8 to 10 miles from where Fair was last seen. They were also about 3,000 feet above the elevation where Fair's hunting companions last saw him. Among items found in the backpack were gloves, a space blanket, a compass, ammunition. The space blanket had been used. A cause of passing was never mentioned, nor is it clear how long Corey lasted before he passed away. It was said that Corey would have travelled uphill the majority of his time spent missing. Just for some additional clarity, when the helicopters initially searched this area, they never found any thermal indication of Corey's presence. Thomas Seeger was 33 years old when he disappeared in the Sierra High Country of California on the 7th of October 1973. The first I heard of Thomas was from the Redlands Daily Fax newspaper, who picked up the story three days after he disappeared. The article I came across stated that one lost, dazed hunter had just been found in this area, but now the sheriff and searchers were out again looking for another, this of course being Thomas. At the time, Thomas had been out with his friends hunting in the vicinity of Dinky Creek. Similar to Corey, the pair had split up to cover more ground and were supposed to meet up again after hunting for a number of hours. Volunteers and professional search and rescue parties joined a dozen Fresno County Sheriff's deputies today, seeking to find Thomas who became separated from his hunting companions in rugged terrain in the Ross Meadow area near Patterson Mountain. Thomas is an experienced woodsman and was warmly dressed to cope with near freezing overnight temperatures, officers said. Unfortunately, right as the search began, plans were put in place to have aircraft equipped with thermal imaging technology flying overhead, but the weather would suddenly worsen to the point that it became too dangerous. The sheriff deputies also made a statement saying that no trace of Thomas had yet been discovered. What was particularly interesting about this was that the spot from which Thomas had disappeared within the Ross Meadow was that he was practically surrounded by roads on all sides of this wilderness area, meaning that any direction he took, at most he would come across a road within a couple of miles. Because Thomas had some supplies on him, this gave searchers hope that one way or another, Thomas would be found safely. 
or he'd make his own way out of the forest and follow along one of the roads. However, as time went on, this just simply wasn't happening. Deputies and other searchers pressed on, burdened by a failure to uncover any clues. The searchers on the ground and in the air were skeptical of a pair of 32 caliber shell casings found in the general area where Thomas was last seen. It's the same kind of shells Seeger was using, but they're not really considered a clue. The shell is commonly used by hunters, said the sheriff's spokesman. The point was also made that even if the shells did belong to Thomas, it really didn't help them, given that all it told them was that he'd been hunting and been in this area, which they already knew. The following day on the 15th, so eight days into the search now, it was reported that they saw flickering lights in the forest the night prior, which they thought might have been a campfire. Searchers stated that they believed that this might have been Thomas, and on that day, they travelled in the direction of the lights, but as far as I'm able to tell, they never found anything. The sheriff and his deputies at this point also began to theorise that Thomas must have been injured, and in a situation whereby he couldn't walk. They were coming to this conclusion because as said before, all Thomas had to do was pick a direction and walk, and eventually he would have come to a road, but this never happened. We learn at this point in the final article that Thomas was an intelligent man, had great outdoor skills, and had been in this area hunting many times before. Thomas's disappearance continues to baffle Fresno law enforcement authorities. While more private helicopters have been hired to continue the search, Mr. Seeger is an experienced outdoorsman, and searchers believe a hunter of his experience would have been found unless some accident had befallen him. From what I can tell, those were the final words ever written about Thomas Seeger, and needless to say that he was never found. As reported, the sheriff's office and searchers alike were left baffled. It seems that many thought that when they saw the flickering lights in the forest, they believed it was Thomas who'd made a campfire. But upon searching the area, there was no trace of him, and I'm not even sure that they found a campfire either. The only potential clue that was ever found was the shell casings, and after that, there was just nothing. What happened to Thomas Seeger? At the time, 42-year-old Dan Campbell disappeared whilst on an illegal elk antler gathering trip in Yellowstone National Park. Dan was last seen on the 6th of April 1991 when his friends dropped him off with his dog at the Hellroaring Creek Trailhead in Yellowstone National Park. According to BozemanDailyChronicle.com, Campbell had arranged for his girlfriend to meet him in the Jardine area outside the park two days later. When he didn't show up, Tracy reported him as missing to Yellowstone and Park County authorities on the 8th of April. The authorities, alongside the park rangers, began the search for Dan almost immediately after learning about it, but failed to find any sign of him. Similar to Fran's disappearance, there is little information in regards to how the search was conducted and how many people were involved. But from my understanding, search dog teams were involved, as were helicopters, and while specifics aren't mentioned, all sources indicate that the search was extensive. While the precise date of when Dan had gotten into trouble is not known, BozemanDailyChronicle.com states that Dan travelled lightly without much gear and was accompanied only by his dog indicating that he wasn't with anyone else at the time, nor did he plan on meeting up with anyone. They also state that a heavy spring snowstorm hit the forested plateaus around the time of his disappearance, or perhaps shortly thereafter. Which of course, either way, will have had a negative impact on the search effort. Almost two months later, on the 30th of May, the Daily Interlake reported this. Two camps stocked with provisions had been found near where a big timber man disappeared in Yellowstone National Park's backcountry almost two months ago. However, the fate of Dan Campbell remains a mystery. The two camps were stocked with military ready to eat meals, chewing tobacco, tea and dried beans. Johnson said he did not know if Campbell or other antler collectors set up the camps. Foul play could be a factor in the disappearance of Campbell, Johnson said. It's not completely clear why the thought of foul play was introduced here since no evidence had presented itself to point in that direction. 
However, it's worth mentioning that because the search efforts had failed and the search dogs couldn't find Dan's scent, Dan's brothers were also contemplating and later insisting on the idea that foul play must have occurred here. In an article by Deseret News, Dan's brothers stated, If Dan's in the park, he's buried, I don't think that he's alive. How that demise came, well, I've got a lot of mixed emotions about it. Investigators of Campbell's disappearance, including the FBI and the National Park Service, say that they have absolutely no clues as to his whereabouts or his dog. We're really not doing a whole lot at this point because we've got nothing to go on, Johnson said. If we would come up with any new leads or information today or tomorrow, that would change. It's worth mentioning that Dan was highly experienced in the outdoors with camping and hunting, which may have contributed to their belief that he didn't simply succumb to the environment. The authorities stated that there were three possibilities. That he had gotten lost or had been involved in an accident, or he wanted to disappear or foul play was involved, but ultimately no sign of Dan has ever been found. The brothers would later bring about a lawsuit against the authorities involved in the search, stating that they did not believe the investigation was conducted in a satisfactory manner and the brothers made the claim that much of the evidence gathered at the time has been disposed of or lost. It's not clear what evidence they were referring to specifically, but the sheriff insisted that no evidence of foul play was found and instead the case remained open as a missing persons case. However, the brother's lawyer noted that the Montana Criminal Investigation Bureau was involved in the investigations at some point, despite no one ever being identified as a suspect, and that they do not normally investigate a missing persons case. It's not clear what the extent of their involvement was or why they were involved. Does this indicate that at one point or another, the authorities did think that a third party had been involved in the disappearance? It's unclear, and there's no further word on that. Sheriff Clark Carpenter, who replaced Johnson in 1998, did have a second look at the case, and his final words were, No one was ever identified as a suspect in the case, though some horn hunters were questioned. The search teams made a tremendous attempt to find this guy, but when the leads run out, they run out. In the end, Dan, nor any trace of him or his dog has ever been found and it's unlikely that we'll ever know what happened or where he went. Mel Nadell was 61 years old when he disappeared on the 6th of September 2009 from Elk Mountain in the Santa Fe National Forest, New Mexico. Specifically, this incident occurred not far from Pecos while Mel was hunting with two friends of his. He was well armed at the time and had the ability to look after himself, but his primary hunting technique was to use a bow. It's important to know right off the bat that Mel had incredible experience in the outdoors and with hunting. He had been to Elk Mountain a lot and this was one of his favourite places to hunt. Mel was also familiar with becoming lost as he had done so once in the past, years before this incident took place. He made a mistake in the Jemez Mountains and things got a bit hairy. He became panicked after realising he couldn't find his way and through firing into the air, his friends were able to locate him. In some ways, obviously, because of the outcome, this incident was probably good for Mel in some sense because he became much more cautious after this took place. He didn't hunt again without a GPS, apparently. After that, he only ever hunted nearby the camp and wouldn't stray too far from it. To further this point actually, Mel had a knee injury which also prevented him from travelling very far as he couldn't move long distances anymore, and it also needed to be wrapped up that day. It seems that as a general rule, what he actually did instead was to find a quiet place he could camouflage in and wait for prey to arrive and pass by. At 4.30pm on the day of Mel's disappearance, he and two of his friends all split up from the campsite. It's never made clear exactly how far Mel was supposed to stray from the camp, but from what I can gather, it was supposed to be somewhere between 150 and 300 yards away. Something during this short walk would go horribly awry because he would never be seen again, and to this day, it's still not known what happened. Mel was realised as missing when his two friends, as originally planned, arrived back to the campsite as darkness began to set in. They sat there, 
I imagine, somewhat confused, because Mel should have been the first to arrive back, given his close proximity. The two friends sat down together and waited for him, presumably wondering if Mel might be finishing up. Though as time went on and it got darker and darker, they began to panic. The pair set out to retrieve Mel, wandering off in the same direction he took initially, but they found no sign of him at all. They were shouting and calling his name loudly, but they would never receive a reply. It's at this point that they knew that they were in over their heads and they were able to contact the authorities and report what had happened here. Just something important to note is that outside of Mel's knee, he was actually a very fit man. Unfortunately, heart problems did run in his family and it seems that he wanted to offset these problems and would inspire him to become a black belt in Taekwondo which is an impressive feat, and shows his dedication to his craft. According to charlieproject.org, Mel left his 2001 Jeep Cherokee with the New Mexico license plate number blank near the campsite with most of his gear locked inside, including his backpack, cell phone, and GPS unit. He normally carried the GPS with him while he hunted to keep from getting lost. Given Mel's prior experience with getting lost and the sheer panic he felt with that strikes me as a bit odd. We all have our moments of absent-mindedness, but when you have experienced some trauma, even in very minor cases, you tend to be very aware of the details surrounding it. Now of course, you can't go throwing wild accusations around or anything like that, and there was no evidence of foul play or anything of that nature, but I do hope and I'm sure that people were questioned appropriately, but Occam's razor would state that he probably just forgot it in the jeep, since that makes the least amount of assumptions. I found this particularly interesting also. Dogs tracked Mel's scent for about 50 yards from the camp, down the trail he said he would use. His loved ones stated he had become lost once before, and after that experience, he preferred to stick close to the campsite. Mel's family doesn't believe he left of his own accord, and police can't find any evidence of foul play in his disappearance. He is presumed to have become lost or injured in the wilderness. Okay, a couple of things there. Again, it strikes me as odd that the dogs would track Mel for 50 yards before completely losing the scent. Reasonably speaking, given his situation, he actually shouldn't have been too much further from that point. So where did he go and what even happened? It's like he randomly vanished from the face of the earth in that moment down the trail. There were many dogs present in this search and searching parties scattered in all directions from the point where the scent was lost, but they never found anything and his scent was never found again either. It's been 13 years now and no signs have ever presented themselves. His equipment has never been stumbled upon, nor his clothing or anything else. It's also interesting that his family stated that they don't believe that he left of his own accord, but this entails a couple of things. Firstly, they may disagree with the official conclusion that he had simply got lost in the wilderness because that statement, if taken a certain way, could suggest that they don't even believe that he's there anymore. That's speculation on my part of course, but you could hardly blame someone for thinking that way. You have a man that can't walk long distances, had a bad knee, and told people he wouldn't be very far from the camp down the trail. If he had walked off into the wilderness, what could have possessed him to take this action? Did he become spooked? Was there a third party present? Did an animal get a bit close for his liking? His friends never heard him fire any rounds this time and he was armed at the time as said. I just want to make this clear again that this is mostly just a thought experiment now. It's all speculation because the problem is that there was quite literally no evidence of anything whatsoever. Now, you can place Mel on that trail, at least to begin with, because the dogs are able to follow his scent down it for a short distance. Why did it abruptly stop? What caused that? Was that the moment something happened? As said, there was nothing in the area to insinuate that he had come to harm or anything like that. So what happened to Mel Nadell and where did he go? 
I'd just like to take the time to thank you for watching, and a big thank you to the patrons who have been running around and disappearing on the screen. If you found the video interesting, then please do leave a like, hit the bell, and subscribe if you haven't already. If not, then feel free to leave a dislike, I'm just looking for your honest opinion either way. I hope that you've had a great day, or evening, depending on where you are, and I'll see you in the next one. Be safe guys, peace.